your goal is to remain the same age biologically for 365 days of chronological time. The goal here is to be the next evolution of human. Welcome to Live Well, Be Well, a show to help high performers improve their health and well-being. Are you tired of feeling older than your years? Well, buckle up because in this episode, we're delving into the cutting edge world of anti-aging with tech entrepreneur, Brian Johnson. After selling his company to PayPal for a cool 800 million, Brian is now on a mission to stay young forever and save humanity in the process. He has spent an eye-watering $154 million in the process and launched his project called Blueprint, which aims to reduce the biological age of all 76 of his organs. And it seems to be working. At 45 years of age, his skin is now as youthful as an 18-year-old's. But don't worry, you don't need to spend millions to benefit from Brian's wisdom. In this episode, we'll discover his daily protocol, including sleep being the new coffee and fasting for 20 hours a day. We also dive into his Xeroth principle thinking theory, which is how he generates totally original ideas for humanity. So get ready to take your self-care practice to the next level and learn how to live a better, more youthful life. When I look at kind of what you've done in the last few years, you've personally invested $154 million to fund research towards an optimal healthcare plan. You spent $2 million a year on your own health protocol. So then this got me thinking, how much does the average person in the UK spend on their health? And when I looked at the Office of National Statistics, this might shock you, it was £3,840. So... From two million to three thousand eight hundred and forty pounds. By that metric, <laughs> it feels like you might outlive everyone, <laughs> or <laughs> at least most of the people around you. And then I thought, does that scare you? Do you mm. do you feel lonely by that thought or not? Mm. There are the relationships that I have now that I prize. Mm-hmm. My my children and my family and my friends and coworkers. And then there's always new friends that I'm making that I value. You know, we do really well with death as a species. Mm. You know, we, um, we have mourning rituals and we have remembrance rituals. And now technology is getting to a point where uh, we can digitally recreate people mm-hmm. with all the material we have of them. I've, I have uh, several friends who've engaged in that kind of activity where they've uh, recreated a parent or some a loved one. Using so AI, the, mm-hmm. yeah, just the wow. incorporation of, of all their everything, all their output, everything they wrote, all the images of them, everything they they said. That if someone has a a large enough digital archive, they can be recreated. And you know, using these these AI models, it's pretty good. You could actually have a conversation and uh, get the majority of the thought patterns. And so I'd say we're we're getting pretty good at doing this. Uh, you're basically you're proposing a question of you know can my brain do I perceive my brain being able to adapt to new circumstances uh, if that includes most of my loved ones not carrying on because they're not taking care of their health as best they could and I would say as sad as that would be uh, my primary objective in life is to is to be as adaptable as possible. The number one characteristic that defines me is to be adaptable, is what I'm really trying to achieve because I think that's the skill set that will be most valuable in the future. And um, it just, it it takes some mental gymnastics and some practice. And it's a, maybe a nuanced form of a combination of, of love and care and detachment and iteration and honoring and all the above. But I don't feel wed to any given thing about myself, about my ideas, about my existence. I really just care to exist. Everything else, I'm open to it being altered. I really want to touch upon the philosophy on how you've launched several of these projects. And it's something which I've read that you called zero principle thinking. And it's your plan for humanity, which discusses the idea of future-proofing ourselves. So to frame the discussion today, I'd love for you to talk about these concepts and 
what they are and how they've influenced what you've gone on to do following Braintree? I guess it started when I was 21. I decided that I wanted to spend my life doing something useful for humanity, something that in the 25th century would be worthy to be in the history books. You know, like the, uh, they would be reflecting and say, in the early 21st century, what happened that changed the course of human history? And I wanted to try to make a contribution in that way. And I didn't know what exactly I was going to do, and I wasn't really talented at anything. I had no standout skills. And so I determined I was going to make a whole bunch of money, and then with a whole bunch of money by the age of 30, go out and find something to do. And as after I did that with Braintree Venmo and, and sold that company, uh, I began thinking about this question very seriously. And I kept on running, running up against these mental blocks of how to think about this emergent future when it cannot be predicted or modeled or you know, whatever. So I mean, for example, to give a, a, a concrete example, AlphaGo is an AI program that learned how to play the game Go. And in the AI community, most didn't think that AI could beat the world champion Go player for quite some time, you know, 10, 20 years. And then the engineers got to working on AlphaGo, and when AlphaGo played Lee Sedol, which is, you know, he was a 19-time world champion. The past, yeah. Exactly. It, uh, the experts watching the game describe it as AlphaGo playing Go from another dimension. It made several moves and had several strategies that were so foreign to humans, it remade the game Go. So that to me is an example of a, a zeroth principle play where you take a foreign form of intelligence, you apply it to a domain where human genius has been playing at it for thousands of years, and in a matter of days, it discovers brand new things. And so in my mind, I, I knew this was an example of, of what the future might be like, and I kept on running up against these, these limitations of my own imagination and creativity. I could just feel myself hitting my own limitations. And so I went to bed one night and assigned my brain the problem of how to come up with a conceptual framework on how to punch through this limitation so I could still model out a future of behavior. And I, that night I dreamt about zero principle thinking, that uh, first principle thinking is very common uh, but zero principle wasn't a concept. And so the easiest way to describe this is first principle, uh, so talent hits the target no one else can. Genius hits the target no one can see. And this is a reminder that we spend the majority of our lives playing games that other people gave to us. We're essentially trying to be ranked in that game. And zero principle is finding brand new games no one knows exist. And that's really what, to me, after thinking about this for years and trying to decide where to spend money, where to invest money but in the, the creation of systems and technology that can create zeroth level insight. Because when that happens, it creates the most substantial leveling up of aspirations. I mean, that's exactly what you've gone on to do. But something that I find fascinating is if we look at us as humans... Okay, and we were trying to search for these truly original ideas, which which exactly what you're talking about. How do you prepare your mind for that exercise? Because we are so biased by the ideas which we grew up in, the societal pressures. It happened in baby steps. The, my first real experience with this was when I had chronic depression. And my mind would just dump on me all day, every day, the worst vitriol. It was you know, like the worst hater, the worst troll. And it would uh, sack from me all of my hope for existence. And it was relentless. And then I learned in trying to manage my depression that I am not my thoughts. And it was the most liberating experience I'd had in my depressive state that when a thought landed that said that life was hopeless and that there was no reason to exist, I could politely say, thank you, mind, you know, for the suggestion, but you are not me. And I was able to separate myself from my thoughts. And then the next beat was I learned... I read up on uh, cognitive psychology and I learned about 188 cognitive biases that we have, you know, shortcuts we make to understand the complicated reality. They're actually very useful and evolutionary designed, but as a whole, uh, we actively distort our reality to try to make sense of it. And that results in me being hypocritical and inconsistent and uh, I'm a disaster. When I actually really have self-awareness to see my own cognition, 
I'm a disaster. My memory's faulty. I make things up, you know, all the above. And that was another humbling moment. So I'm not my thoughts. And also, I don't know if I can trust anything my mind is telling me, mm -hmm. uh, period, because of all these biases. And then third was thinking about what can I model out and expect from the future? And with zeroth principle emergence, kind of nothing. And that's why I really revert back to now being most comfortable in a hyperfluid state where things are passing through my brain, I observe them, I'm working on given things, I try to focus on the stuff that can be focused on for whatever duration of time. But it's a disposition that I think we will want to incorporate into the future of being human. And it's, a, it's difficult to do this because our, mm. uh, by default, we convince ourselves we're right and others are wrong. We, c we put blinders on these things and we don't want to see them because they're unpleasant. And so it's, it's a really challenging thing for humans to fully reconcile like the disastrous situation that is our minds. Our minds are really powerful, but I think so many people listening to this will not even know where to start with it. I mean, you've obviously gone on such an extreme journey and you're on quite an extreme journey right now compared to the average individual. What's kind of a first step somebody can take to breaking this bias for them? Yeah, I'll give you an example that uh, really helped me out. This is something mm -hmm. I do when I interview people for my companies or, and I do at these uh, blueprint brunches I hold. So I'll, I'll do a thought experiment and I'll uh, ask for a volunteer and I'll say, let's just do a back and forth and we'll accomplish something in this thought experiment. So I start off and say, let's imagine we are in a social environment, four or five of us friends are together, it's light banter, we're having fun, I turn to you and say, hi, friend, I really am interested in wanting to be properly hydrated and I've been wanting to make sure I'm drinking enough water. Could you please tell me how much water I should drink in a given day? Now, it depends on the person, but typically their response is something as the following. They'll say, well, I have this hydro flask with me. I carry it everywhere I go. I drink multiple a day. I'm always in the bathroom. It's annoying. I chose the pink one because I love pink, and pink is a, a color that gets me excited. Weirdly, my dog barks at it, and my mom recently is like, why is your dog barking so much at the pink flask? And I'm like, I don't know, but my friend Susan, she drinks a lot of water too. She feels great, and her skin, oh my God, it's beautiful. So let's go back to our first our discussion. You know, like, I'm really interested in hydration. How much water do you think I should drink? You know, eight cups a day, you know, two flasks or whatever. And I'll say, Sarah, have you seen any evidence that this is something that I should do? Well, I read it somewhere. Do you know where? No, like some blog. Do you know who wrote the blog or did you see the actual evidence? No. But so how do you know? I don't know. So then I read the thought experiment now that we've had a cycle. And if the person's been paying attention, I'll say, how much water do you think I should drink? And they sh the appropriate response will be, I don't know. And not only do I not know, I have so many more questions than I do answers. For example, is thirst even something we should pay attention to? Because I know I'm hungry, but every time I'm hungry, I shouldn't eat because that leads to me being heavier. Is there such a thing as water obesity? Does my thirst signal change in time? Is it, does it go, does it, does it deteriorate with time? And all the follow-on questions. But the exercise is meant to point out how much time we spend parroting knowledge that we don't know is true. And if you actually mm -hmm. look at the, when we speak, what do we actually know and don't know? And then what do we, how do we represent ourselves and what we do know and don't know? And then if you actually look at the data, I mean, it's surpri we know surprisingly little. And it, the, the example is really to bring to someone's awareness what they do know and what they don't know, and to have the self-awareness and intelligence to say, I don't know, because not knowing something is oftentimes the more intelligent answer than purporting to know something. Mm. I mean, the I don't know teach me mindset is one of the strongest mindsets to be in. But it's one of the hardest for many people, because for many people, that feels like a failure. Or that that's feels right. that, you know, that's a, that's a blow on their self-esteem that they don't know the answer to something. Whereas actually exactly. it's a really curiosity mindset to be yourself and actually open your mind to new possibilities. Exactly. In that situation, the person is also trying to optimize for social cohesion. 
and emotional comfort. And like, oh, they're trying to optimize for all these things. They're not people debating, you know, scientific on hydration. But in that moment, we culturally, we allow something to be said and something to be believed, but no one actually knows. And so now the group has this erroneous perception that they know something and they don't. And then people get righteous about it and then they fight about it. And so to me, this is, these are the, the wonderful things to be aware about our own thinking, that if we are cautious about how we think and we are aware of boundaries of things we do and don't know, it leads us to better outcomes because then we're less likely to be doing things that would otherwise be incorrect. I think part of this and what I'm hearing as well leads me to something that I read on your blog, which was when you finished and sold Braintree, um, you sold it for 800 million to PayPal. You mentioned in that moment, or what I read that you mentioned was a single question that mattered to you. And I feel like this really entwines what you're just saying, but it's, a question that I'd love to ask you now. And you said to yourself, how do we collectively thrive beyond what we can imagine? Mm -hmm. What was the answer that you came to from that single question that you asked yourself? I really hope you're enjoying this chat, but I'm going to pause it for just a second to thank my sponsor that has made it all possible. Lima are the ultimate wellness brand right now, and they've completely revolutionized what a supplement can be. Live Well, Be Well is all about finding evidence-backed ways to improve your physical and mental health, which is why I am so excited to have Lima on board, because we're all too familiar with the symptoms of stress, poor sleep, problem skin, or inflammation. Lima's award-winning supplement contains 10 powerful ingredients, all in one unique formula. So you don't have to worry about the hassle of taking multiple supplements. But listen to this though, and this is why they're one of my favorite wellness and beauty brands. They've created a game-changing device called Lima Laser. It's the world's most powerful at-home laser and can transform your skin in as little as 12 weeks. You can use it to help treat so many major skin conditions and it's safe for all skin tones and types with zero pain or downtime. It's also completely safe to use around the eyes despite it being 100 times more powerful than LED. Lima is an award-winning brand trusted by household names like Ellie Golding and Victoria Beckham. You may have also spotted Gwyneth Paltrow, Hailey Bieber and Kim Kardashian all raving about their Lima lasers on Instagram. So experience the Lima difference and begin your journey to a more vibrant you. Don't let life's ups and downs hold you back. Visit lima.life forward slash podcast. That's Lima l-y-m-a dot life slash podcast today to receive four months of Lima's award-winning supplement for just the price of three because there's no better feeling than feeling your best i'll tell you a story uh that indirectly gets at your answer in uh okay this might be a little bit controversial with where you live and where i live okay in 1776 <laughs> Thomas Paine wrote a pamphlet in the United States. At the time, there were 13 colonies. And mm -hmm. it was the most widely read pamphlet in the early American uh, colonies. And it argued and it said, the British monarch is corrupt. Uh, the monarch cannot be trusted. The monarch is making decisions about how we do things in, as colonies, but he doesn't have the information to make these decisions. He's, a, he's an ignorant monarch and he's corrupt. Like he's doing bad stuff. We really need a different form of governance where we can manage ourselves. You know, this was like the emergent democracy with representation and whatnot. And he wrote this pamphlet to make this argument because people in the 13 colonies, they were pretty evenly split. Some people were like, yeah, we agree. The British monarch is corrupt and we're not, getting a, a, we're not in, a, in a great situation with them as our ruler. And other people were like, are you kidding me? This, demo, this democracy stuff is insane. Uh, like, no way do we want to govern ourselves in this manner. And his pamphlet was influential, and in six months later, the Declaration of Independence was signed. And my conclusion to your question it was the same. I'm ruled by a corrupt monarch, my mind. 
it is naughty. Uh, it uh, eats more food than it needs to. It is attracted to junk food. It wants to skip my bedtime. It wants to drink alcohol. It wants to do all kind of naughty things which accelerate my aging, increase my likelihood of disease, and ultimately bring an early death. Now, if you contrast that and say, what is the alternative form of governance for Brian? The democratic way is power to the organs, my heart, my liver, and my lungs. Why are they, ever, why are they not consulted? If, if it's proposed that we have a pizza party night with all kinds of naughtiness, why aren't we asking the liver and the heart and the lungs and the pancreas what they, what they want? And so with Blueprint, this is the idea is I wanted to measure every organ of the body, let each organ speak independently with data, and then ask them what they wanted uh, related to, to scientific data. And so the answer I came to was I was trying to do the same revolution with myself that was done from monarch rule to uh, democracies. And I want to empower a different form of governance and power, one that is better suited to take care of me than I can myself. And so it really was identifying my mind as a corrupt source of, of tyrannical power and trying to create checks and balances to keep it at bay so I could really exist in my best interests. Wow. And I feel like it's, it's part of kernel, part of this process, because the kernel's really focused on the mind, isn't it? So the neurotechnology to help support the mind. And I guess that's a really key player in Blueprint. It is. And th so what's enabled Blueprint to happen is measurement. Mm -hmm. My heart can speak because we can get an EKG, an MRI, an ultrasound, and uh, you know, uh, blood pressure. We can get dozens of measurements on my heart because we have technology to measure it. In order to optimize our minds, we need data. We need to be able to measure it. And currently, there's no good technology that allows us for routine, high-quality, low-cost measurement. And that's what mm -hmm. we built at Kernel. And so the idea is, if we really want to improve our minds in a systematic way, from everything we do, from our meditation practices, to homework, to trying to uh, uh, avoid cognitive decline, to a deal with mental health conditions, like anything, science begins with measurement. And that's what we've mm -hmm. been trying to do is start the revolution of mind by giving anyone who's interested in the mind data they can work with to say, is my thing working? How do I build something? What patterns do I see? We just don't have the data. And so trying to build something when you can't really measure it is really hard. Mm. And so that's what you're basically trying to do now. And I think what I just want to break down for our audience who's listening, who might not be aware of Blueprint or may not know much about it, is that your goal, and you correct me with this if I'm wrong, is to remain the same age biologically for 365 days of chronological time. So this requires two things. It's slowing aging process and it's two, reversing the ages, aging process that continues to happen. So if I'm right, you've already knocked off tell me if I'm wrong, five years off your chronological age already from doing this for a year. And you're working on, I think there's 76 organs and 74 organs in the body, but you're working on 70 organs at the moment individually to help reverse and stop this aging process. Yeah, that's well said. Great. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> it's, well, it's well said. Yeah, I mean, what I was trying to ask is humanity has always been focused on the fountain of youth story. And mm -hmm. it's typically told in some variation of people on a boat going to a jungle, traveling to a temple, finding a magic elixir, and drinking it. And mm -hmm. I wanted to, and then most of the other times people are like, hey, it's so amazing that science is progressing forward at this really quick speed. What's coming? And then we get to play in this imagination land of you know, a magic pill. But that's all in the future. And I wanted to ask the question what is available right now? And what we endeavored to do is we went out and looked at all the scientific evidence, everything on health span, lifespan. We prioritized all of it all. And we said, what would happen if we just went all in? We measured every organ of the body. We looked at all the scientific evidence. And I, as the participant, was willing to do everything the algorithm said. And that's what I think is the most compelling part of Blueprint, is mm -hmm. we built an algorithm that takes better care of me than I can. And the significance of that is that you know, when, when the first me the telegraph message was sent, the Pony Express is dead. 
when the first time you could digitally navigate driving from point A to point B, the paper map on the lap is dead. And I'd argue that with Blueprint demonstrating that it takes better care of my health and wellness than I can, I would argue the mind is dead. Mm. And it's, to me, one of the most significant revolutionary points in all of history because algorithmic ability exceeds our capacity. We typically adopt it because it makes our lives better. Now, in this case, it creates significant revulsion in people because they say, oh my God, if I can't choose what I want to eat and when I eat, I don't know why I'm going to exist. You know, like that relationship is so intense. And so to me, it, it really is about uh, reconciling with where we're at in relation to our technology, understanding what things stop us from the things we really care about, which is being alive, mm-hmm. and trying to reconfigure how we could imagine ourselves going forward. But that to me is, is the essence of Blueprint, and that's why I think it's a, a milestone marker in the history of the human race that if we look at it closely, we'll realize a new era is here. It seems so much about this process. A lot of it is around the technology that can actually get us to that next phase. Am I right in saying that? Because that's a lot of what I'm understanding from what you're just telling me at the moment is that the, the, the broader social impact is clearly a material driver of this experiment, especially surrounding the technology. That's right. Yeah, I mean, and to your point on the data, so what, what does the data say? So I'd say the most impressive things to me after doing this for two years is we, yes, we did the 5.1 years of epigenetic age reversal, but we kind of just, we don't really put a whole lot of weight in that because those epigenetic clocks are still emergent. It's still silver, silver grade science. So to me, the more impressive ones are my speed of aging has been slowed by the equivalent of 31 years. My body now accumulates aging damage slower than the average 10-year-old and slower than 88% of 18-year-olds. I have 50 biomarkers that are in the perfect range for optimal clinical outcomes. These are more stringent ranges than just normal. Uh, My body runs three degrees Fahrenheit uh, cooler than normal. Uh, I have 100 biomarkers less than my chronological age. I've done 12 years of biological age reversal of my HRV. I mean, so I have like, you know, 15, 20 of these things But basically, you can look at the data and you can dismiss one or two and say that's not a good measurement or whatever. But when you have hundreds of measurements that all are telling the same story, that my body's in an optimal state and that in many ways my body is acting at a much younger state, then I think it gets interesting in making the case that, you know what, like we, we kind of have had these two ideas, this story of this elixir of the magic of, you know, of the fountain of youth, and then we have this idea of a, of a magic pill coming. But actually, it's here right now. It's just in this form of a pretty rigorous lifestyle and making selections about not doing bad things and uh, following data and science for the good things. I mean, it's not just one pill, it's 100 pills. <laughs> It's 100 pills a day, which is what you're taking. And I really want to come on to that nutritional protocol. But before I do, the one thing that I do find quite quite fascinating on how you're doing this is that you've chosen to do this very publicly. And I personally find it completely fascinating what you're doing. But I do know that you're getting a lot of media backlash. Um, What was the driver to do this publicly? Because you could have just said, I'm going to do this but I'm not going to put myself out there. And you really yeah, have yeah. kind of thrown yourself out. So what was the, what's the driver to do that? Humans are amazing in that once one person demonstrates something is possible, and whether it be running the four-minute mile or flying an airplane across the Atlantic or showing that flight can be done, many more humans can do the exact same thing. It's just one human needs to punch through the perceived limitation. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been trying to do. And so naturally with this is going to come a lot of hate and a lot of vitriol because it's uncomfortable to reconcile with this. And that's wonderful. It's group therapy and it's powerful and it's meaningful and it's, I love it. I love every second of it. But more importantly is it has empowered, I mean, I get, I don't know, a hundred messages a day, uh, people who you know, are pouring their heart out of like, I'm changing myself. Like I'm, I see it. I'm coming after this thing. I, I see the future of being human. I want to be a part of it. And that's to me the most encouraging thing is there's this vibrancy in the field of health and wellness and anti-aging that's never existed. And so uh, it, to me, that's all worth it. 
is mm-hmm. is uh, kicking this thing off. And you know, I work with a lot of people. Uh, we we launched this Rejuvenation Olympics, this leaderboard. For I love that you reverse. call it that, by the way. <laughs> I love that you call this. They were like, I'm not a biohacker. I'm in the Rejuvenation Olympics. And I'm like, that is That's a right. brilliant new term. <laughs> yeah. So I'm working with several people and I'm trying to help them beat me. I mean, it would be a marvelous outcome that someone else you know, took Blueprint, whatever we've open sourced. They find new things, new ways to go about doing it. And then they best me. And that would be the best thing. And it would bring the whole system. So the, the goal here... Again, it's, it's not to be number one, that's ranked. The goal here is to be the next evolution of human and to elevate everyone. And so, of course, this is an uncomfortable conversation because we have a lot of personal habits, societal norms that protect our self-destructive behaviors. They protect our, you know, our imaginations of what we can be in life. So it's expected and it's fine. Does that hit your self-esteem, though? Because when I just think about how... And you were talking talking about this earlier, okay, like our own self-saboteurs within ourselves, you know, that dampens our decisions, affects our Mm self-esteem, and it does actually have a physiological response. It must cause some some type of emotional distress, even if it's not kind of taking you off track. You must at one point just be like, oh. When Blueprint first started gaining global notoriety, there were a few days of pretty intense uh, hate, tumultuous, Mm -hmm. you know, vitriol, whatever, and I shared... A couple days after that, I shared my heart rate variability data. So this is the modulation of my nervous system, whether I was stressed out or whether I was happy. And my nervous system showed via the data that it actually was having fun and it was happy. My HRV went up. And so quite quite the contrary, it wasn't stressful for me. It wasn't something that was sad for me. I actually really enjoyed it. And so it had the inverse effect on me of really giving me energy and um, uh, made me happy. (laughs) Brian, you're not a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would have shot my HRV right up. Um, yeah. I mean, it's amazing, though, that that's actually had the effect on you. And at least we now know it's not going <laughs> to affect the data. <laughs> well, I mean, you put this in contrast. I, I, I was chronically depressed for a decade. So mm. I had the worst troll in existence in my head pounding away at me for a decade. Mm-hmm. And after that... Uh, the trolls that try to launch their stuff at me, they're just so weak. Like Anything anyone tries to throw at me is so weak relative to what depression could get me with. Because depression could sack me from hope. It it could get me to a spot where I'd say, okay, uh, I agree, I don't really know why I would exist, and suicide seems like a pretty reasonable outcome. Like I I deeply empathize with people who are suicidal. It is rational. Mm. Uh, Mm. I've been there, I know it. And so, yeah, I mean, after you've been through that, uh, the hate that humans can deliver it up, you know, is not is really not that bad. Mm. You know, from that, and I can imagine now that your mind obviously is, is is incredibly strong because you've got this insane willpower to go through all of these different protocols. And I just want to touch upon, first of all, I mean, this is kind of my special area, nutrition, your nutrition protocol. Um, mm. And so you have a hundred supplements a day. You now you wake up at five and have breakfast at seven, I think that's right. And then you have a four hour eating window and you finish and you have your dinner at eleven AM. So what time are we there now? What time are we having this conversation? Yeah, it's ten fifty four AM. So dinner is right after our conversation. Dinner is right after this conversation. Okay. Yeah. And then you so you basically fast after this for twenty hours a day. And then you mm-hmm. stop, you discontinue fluids after four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then you do 60 minutes of meditation and HRV tracking before you go to bed. How, first of all, how did this kind of protocol come about that this was one of the best, best to kind of optimize and, and start with? And how do you have dinner at 11 a.m. and not eat for 20 hours? Because I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> by intermittent fasting. But even that for me... <laughs> I feel yeah. that I would struggle with just from a social factor of dinners or evenings with friends um, and the human mm-hmm. connection that you rightly so mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, the importance of that mm-hmm. so much yeah. culturally is around dinner time. So yeah. talk me through this protocol. So when there are social gatherings, so on the weekends or when I'm getting together with friends, I will eat dinner with them at five or six whenever we're there. And what I'll do mm-hmm. is I'll save up 500 or so calories 
And when I'm with them, I'll do something like steamed vegetables. So I'll have some broccoli and carrots and cauliflower. So I really do try to soothe other people's discomforts with my otherwise odd behaviors. So when I have food in front of me, we're together, no one feels awkward. They feel like everyone's cool and we're all participating. If I were to just have nothing in front of me, people would just feel too awkward about the situation. So I really try to soothe it so no one, everyone feels comfortable just being themselves and doing their thing. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing I'm really trying to do though is uh, Blueprint is not a statement that this is the only way to achieve an outcome. It is just simply mm-hmm. an observation to say, a methodical and scientific process to measure everything, look at scientific evidence, and then get the data is mm-hmm. the best way to do this. And that way we avoid being tricked by gurus. We, have, we avoid being tricked by latest fads. We really want to see measurement, science, and data. And that elevates the whole field because most people, they enter this conversation, and you probably have heard this, something like, first they say eggs are good for you, then they say eggs are bad for you. No one knows, and they give up. And that kind of defeatism of a disposition means you can't you know, inch away. My statement is not that this is the only way to achieve it. It's just like follow the process and mm-hmm. you may find your system work as well or better. But it's just mm-hmm. trying to incorporate this into our health and wellness that we can build it in a systematic way. And so my routine is basically that, is we are trying to follow the very best evidence everywhere we can go. And you know, a recent person came over and did some filming here and he, he threw this question at me. He's like, so what would happen, man, if you're in the jungle? Like you get dropped into the jungle and you have to fight a wild animal. And I was like, yeah, I'd probably lose. Like hey, I'm, I'm not training to fight a wild animal in the jungle. Uh, I'm not mm. trying to become an Olympic athlete. I'm trying to dramatically slow my speed of aging so I can be part of the future. And so my objectives are extremely narrow. I'm not trying to build gigantic muscle mass. I'm not trying to train for a marathon. And so when you understand that Blueprint is a process and I have a very narrow objective, then these things become much uh, more sensible. Whereas uh, if you look at it from the outside, then you know, people are more likely to be upset saying like, well, that's wrong because of the following thing or they'll, they'll put their little thing into the conversation. But to me, it's really about elevating everyone doing their objectives through a process that's methodical and rigorous. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the whole thing that we have to see this as is an experiment, isn't it? It's an experiment that's mm-hmm. never been done before. And so I think that is such an important way to approach this conversation. When, you know, you're a vegan, we don't know if this is the right protocol, but we just know that, you know, vegan for you is, is your own personal decision. Um, and it, we do know from, you know, from, from research that plant-based foods are, you know, have outstanding research in areas of longevity. Um, but what I find quite interesting is the restriction. Okay, so you are on just below 1,000 977 calories a day. I think that's right. So, mm-hmm. you know, we normally say, and I and I, I don't always believe necessarily in calories, but, you know, two and a half thousand, normally we say to for most males your age, probably if you're weight, how are you yeah. working with your hunger signals? Because I think most people listen to this. The first question that's going to come into their head is, is he hungry or does he mm-hmm. ever get cravings? I think that's going to be yeah. quite a common question that listeners will want to know. I have a, a life philosophy that all good things are on the other side of pain. And that doesn't mean we need to seek out pain. It just means that when we are engaged in something that we care about, whether it be scoring well on a test or working hard at a relationship or building a a podcast business or whatever anyone is doing, we know we naturally experience pain. We don't want to work. We want to procrastinate. We, we, like we, you know, we could do a 50% job or we could do a 100% job. That's a lot more painful to be focused that much longer. We encounter pain every day, all day. And every time we encounter it, it's a test of our will. Are we going to do the job we really want to do or are we going to succumb to pain? And it's just a, a truism of life. And the people who are able to achieve things uh, that are extraordinary have an unusual capacity to negotiate with pain. And sometimes they push through it, sometimes they relish in it, sometimes they morph it, but they have some way to negotiate uh, that to be a facilitator for their excellence. And as a, as a species, it's possible that we have become too sensitive to pain. You know, if we're bored for half of a second, we pull the phone up and want the, the dopamine from TikTok. And if we, you know, like you run it through, we basically have become pain adverse 
and it may be lessening our ability to be excellent. And so to me, this is all about, I have an objective that I'm trying to achieve. And if I experience pain in the process, I just see it as a learning opportunity to achieve something that could be extraordinary if I can just simply negotiate my way through this pain. I'd love for you just to try and explain to me how you've managed to get this strength Mm. to do what you do and just not have a cheat day or not feel exhausted Mm. or, and I feel like I can see it not just in blueprint, I can kind of see it throughout everything you've done. You are this fascinating individual that seems to have this amazing determination and strength. Even though it might not have been in health and other areas, you've still had this insane drive and willpower throughout your work. Thank you for your kind words. This question feels a little bit like, how much water should I drink? So in this moment, uh, you just served me up a question and it kind of opens this, this opportunity for me to compile a bunch of words together that tells a story about myself, mm-hmm. but I honestly have no idea. Uh, the only thing I'm aware of is when I, I've taught myself that when I encounter discomfort, to stop and to carefully analyze it because it could be a treasure chest. If I can just figure out where the pain's coming from, what it's about, and what I can do to negotiate with it, I may find a very big win. And this comes in hard conversations with people. You know, like what, what's causing the friction? Why are we upset with each other? How do we reconcile with the situation? It, it happens everywhere. And so I guess I, I have a pain finder that leads me to goodness. And I just really appreciate pain because it's probably my most viable teacher in life. It's like a guide. And so I don't know. Um, I have no idea what energy source is driving that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's beyond my self-awareness. Other than, I mean, this is what I teach my children as well, is uh, to seek this out and to have the self-awareness to negotiate with it. Have they come on board, your children? Like, are they, do they, do they want to try this? Have they tried part of it? Are they on any protocols? Like, are they, are they curious? Like, what's their relationship with, mm-hmm. with what you're doing and also with you? Has their relationship changed since you've started doing this? With you. Yeah, my, my boys, my, I have 19, 17, and 13. So my 19-year-old was on it for quite some time. He's at college now, and it's harder for him to maintain at college. So he's mm. doing his best. My 17-year-old's with me, and he is fully on the protocol. So we are identical in what we do. And then my 13-year-old, you know, she's got other interests in life currently. <laughs> so I think in time, <laughs> she may express some interest, but in, you know, she's, she has other things that she's focused on. But in all of the situations, I... I've been transparent with my children about everything. When I hmm. made money, uh, the very first thing I did is I showed them the bank account and I showed mm-hmm. them how much money we had and I showed them the investments I made and I showed them how the investments change in value. I took the path not of hiding this from them and then when they're in their 20s, like, oh, surprise, like we have money. Uh, I was entirely transparent. And so we've, our relationship has always been that way and I've told them they can just do what they want and I'm happy to support them in their own endeavors. This is not superimposed on them. A friend of my son's, he was taking this super veggie dish to school and eating it every day. So he would have his few pounds of vegetables with him and his friends would be eating pizza, soda, and Doritos. And his friend tweeted out a picture of him eating the vegetables and he said, "Um, I don't know what's going on uh, with this. He's eaten this every day for the past month. I hope everything's okay at home. But his friend's observation was, it's so weird that my friend is eating vegetables for lunch. You know, is everything okay at home? And I just love that. It defied social norms so badly and it didn't occur to anyone that pizza, Doritos, and soda would be the odd out. You know, it's just like, damn, this is weird. Why, why the vegetables? We haven't spoken about that yet, but what is in one of, your, one, of the, one of the meals that you have throughout the day? Yeah, breakfast is cauliflower, broccoli, black lentils, ginger, garlic, hemp seeds. Mm-hmm. And then tell me about the one that's got chocolate in it, because I think people might think you never have anything sweet, but you do have uh, yeah. some chocolate. I do. I have 15 grams a day of 100% dark, undutched, tested for heavy metal, high polyphenol count chocolate. And it's bitter. And if someone is accustomed to milk chocolate, uh, it can be a surprise taste, but the bitterness is amazing. And so sometimes I'll pair the chocolate with my vegetables. 
it's a pairing that's surprising to many people, but the bitterness does really well. And then sometimes I'll put it in this other nutty pudding mix, which is uh, nuts and berries. But yeah, 15 grams a day, and it's an absolute delight. I mean, that sounds delicious. I'm looking at some dark chocolate next to me now. It's only 80%. So I'm not on your 100% yet, but it's. Uh, I feel like you've got one to five on your blueprint scoring, and I think I'm about a two to maybe a three. I'd put myself at a three on uh, your blueprint scoring with the chocolate, which I love this protocol through where actually blueprint stands, which is number five, which is, can you tell me the fifth, the highest standard of chocolate? Yeah, high, high polyphenols. High polyphenols. And so yeah. the next one I just want to touch upon is sleep, okay? Because this is this for me, I think, is one of the most important pillars of health because I think if you get your sleep right, everything else becomes a little bit easier throughout your day. Yes. Now, talk to me about your sleep routine. So my sleep routine, I, I like to think of myself just like I like the idea of I'm a professional rejuvenation athlete. Mm-hmm. I like to think I'm a professional sleeper and I behave that way. And uh, it's my number one priority in life mm-hmm. because I am a creature that is subject to my biochemical states. And when I don't sleep well, I'm ornery and I'm discouraged about life and I don't feel as much hope and my mind is cloudy and I make inferior decisions. And mm-hmm. so there's just there's not a single thing I can do in my existence that is more powerful to influence my conscious mind, that influence my mind, period, than sleep. And so I basically design my life around sleep. And so talk to me about your sleep protocol. You've got a blacked out room, okay? Mm-hmm. Is, your, is this right, your 8 p.m. that you go to sleep? Yeah, eight, yeah, eight thirty. I mean, basically, my my sleep my sleep schedule my sleep routine begins the moment I wake up, and so the the reason why I eat the majority of my food in the earlier hours of the day is because the the data I accumulated showed that when I was able to get my resting heart rate at around forty five or so by the time I would lay down to go to bed, I would have a wonderful night's sleep. My my resting heart rate was my best predictor of my sleep, and I could track my resting heart rate back to how many calories I'd had in the, day, in the day and what kinds of food I'd eaten and how long I'd been fasting. And so that's why really my eating routine is really optimized for sleep more than anything else. So I, I uh, yeah, the 10-hour fast before I go to bed helps me. Again, this is not to say this is the only way to do things. This is only to say I've used measurement and data to decide what I'm going to do. So yeah, so 10 hours before bed, blacked out room, a temperature-controlled mattress, and... Uh, a one hour wind down time before bed. If I work right up to the moment I lay down to the pillow, I'm, my brain is still in this uh, work mode and it's ruminating on all the stuff going on. And then all night, I'm just going to dream and toss over all the to dos and all the fires I have to put out. And so, unless I need an hour to settle myself down before the night, I do have the luxury of sleeping by myself. So I don't have to negotiate with a partner on their sleep time or when they get up or other things like that. And I also have the luxury where my children are now old enough where they can take care of their own nights. So I'm no mm-hmm. longer battling with babies, which, you know, like, boy, that's like just oh, okay. almost un- <laughs> uncontrolled chaos that is just uh, I do it's very think hard. Any parent that's listening to this think, is thinking that their longevity is just being cut in half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The sleepless nights, right? But you, you've yeah. just mentioned that you sleep alone. So are you in a relationship right now? Thank you for listening to this episode so far. I want to quickly tell you about my sponsor, Arena Flowers, who I personally reached out to to sponsor this show as I've been a loyal customer of theirs for two years and I love everything about them. If you follow me, you'll see arena flowers are always around my house and they really brighten up my day. For me, a vital pillar of my self-care routine is self-love and having flowers around my house is so important for me to achieve that. If you're watching the video version of this episode, you can see spring has well and truly arrived at my house. But what sets them apart from the rest? Arena flowers are the UK's number one ethical florist. All their bouquets are hand-tied and delivered in fully recyclable or compostable packaging and free from single-use plastics. Plus, their flowers are sourced from fair trade certified farms. So if you're ready to put a smile on someone's face and positively impact the planet at the same time, 
Download their app now and enjoy free delivery plus 20% off your first purchase. And if it's a last minute present, make sure you order before 9 p.m. for next day delivery. And of course, you're more than welcome to send me some. Recently, I, I've been on a few dates and when I meet people, I, I take to them a list of all the reasons why I'm a bad idea. I feel like I need to give you some de- dating advice. <laughs> Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I think like, you know, like I, I guess I do that because I'm going to be different than what they may imagine because there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a reasonable place, a starting point people can make on how another person's going to behave in the world. And I deviate so dramatically from uh, current norms that I think it's fair to inform them up front, like here's how far I've deviated from what a reasonable person in the year 2023 could expect someone else to behave. And so I feel like I'm doing them a service of being like, hey, here's why you're not going to want to be with me because I'm so different than you know, the norms you're accustomed to. But you're going on these dates. So part of me thinks that you want to find someone, that you want to be in a relationship, have a companion or have somebody in your life. So it's interesting that you turn up with that kind of want, but then you kind of block it with a, well, here's all the things of why not to date me. Well, it's, it's not blocking. It's uh, my attempt at trying to move through time at a, an accelerated pace. So instead of the person arriving at the observation in four months or six months of like, I just can't do this because we differ so much in these patterns, uh, I'd rather not waste the four to six months in that process. I'd rather say, yeah, like we, you know, we enjoy each other, but we're just so fundamentally different in our preferences, it's going to be hard. My, my life is, is you know, pretty full. Like my, my son, he's with me in his last, last year of high school. He's off to college. Uh, he's my best friend. We pal around and do everything together. It's, it's just a phenomenal relationship. So I'm really enjoying this relationship. And once he's gone, then I think it's a different thing for me to solve for a relationship. But you know, as we all know, relationships are uh, among the most challenging things that we humans can engage in. And I've ha- I have a little bit of experience now, and I'm really trying to be thoughtful about how to do this. And, you know, it's, uh, and I think trying to be upfront as much as possible is helpful. Absolutely. I think there's... I hope. there's <laughs> no, it is. And I think, you know, something that really took me by surprise is when you said to me earlier, you know, I do still have dinner. I just move it on the weekends. And so there is that incorporation mm-hmm. that you can have that into your life. And I think that's just an important part, right? It's whoever comes into your life. It's, am I part of that? Or am I behind that? Or what, what's yeah. kind of the, what for you, what, what are you going to put first? I think that's the thing in any relationship that yeah. somebody wants to hear from someone else. And it's also like a, a, a small thing, for example, like in, in my house, I maintain zero naughtiness. So in the pantry, if you have a craving and you want to be naughty, there's nowhere to go. There's absolutely nothing to do in this house. And I do that because I don't trust myself. This reminds me of my modeling days. (laughs) There was nothing. When I had to get into a swimsuit, there was nothing in the house that would tempt me. (laughs) I appreciate that. I mean, like, really, just like Ulysses of old, uh, I don't trust myself and I don't want to put myself in that situation. And so if that person has preferences of what they want to have around, that's going to be too hard for me. I just don't want to spend my emotional energy on having to deal with that. One of my male audience wrote to me, so I I put a question on my Instagram um, of who's coming onto the show and lots of people write into me. Lots of Lots of questions were, you know, what does your wife or partner think about your protocols? But we don't need to answer that because you're a single free man. But I know that recently you spoke about one of the things that was unexpected um, was that you had more erections in the evening, okay? And it reverses back to your teenage days. One of my male audiences saw this and asked a question um, and said, you know, for the male audience, can you give some more advice and information Mm -hmm. towards this? This was a, um, an accidental thing that I made public. So when an article was being written, after it was finished, the, the journalist came back and he said, uh, so yeah, a few people read it, you know, 
and I got this question of like, hey, how do I improve the health of my penis? And I was like, oh, well, funny you asked. Like um, just this week, and I told him what I had been doing. I didn't realize I was on the record and that that was going to go into the article. And then it came out, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh shoot. But yeah, I mean, so what what we are trying to solve for is uh, we we bought this uh, high frequency electromagnetic stimulation machine that does muscle contraction, and we did it to augment my one hour a day exercise uh, protocol. And it's a way you can put these things on every muscle of the body, hamstrings, quads, abs, arms, all, all of the above. And you sit down and you've put in your abs, it's the equivalent of 20,000 sit-ups in 30 minutes, like that many contractions. And so uh, one, of the de- one of the ways you could do it is uh, you can sit on one of the devices and it strengthens your pelvic floor. And so I wondered, I was curious, I thought, okay, so we're optimizing for sleep, one of the things that lessens the quality of my sleep is on average I get up to go to the bathroom one time per night. And every night I cannot go to the bathroom, my sleep is substantially better. And so I wondered if I increase my pelvic floor strength and by proxy my bladder strength, would I have the capacity to sleep through the night every night and not go to the bathroom? And so I started doing it with the objective of sleep. And then every time I woke up, I had an erection. And I was like, what is happening? Every, every time I was aware uh, in my sleep, I thought, what is happening? Why am I having so many erections all the time? And so we, then we started looking into it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th- there's, there's curves showing that as men age, they have fewer and less uh, hard erections over time. And so it's just like this accidental humorous finding. And so the device is, is this high frequency electromagnetic simulation is, I think it's sold throughout the world. We have a, a variant version of it. We have it here at, at the house uh, but people can do them at clinics. They're widely available. And uh, I don't know what the protocol is needed to do it. I don't know how many times. I was doing it daily. Uh, so I don't know what per- somebody could expect. But yeah, it worked. <laughs> but aren't all the best experiments the ones that we just don't know we're doing? That's how LSD was discovered. And yeah. paracetamol was discovered. All of these things were accidents. And I think now these machines are going to all of a sudden have a huge demand <laughs> because now you're openly <laughs> speaking that they're going to help with erections. But this just leads me to a question, which I think is talked about a lot more around sex, that sex is great for our health, okay? So when we talk about sleep routines, they're like, we have it for sleep or we have it for sex. We don't have it for anything else. Mm. Um, And sleep is fantastic, obviously, for our dopamine and our serotonin and our stress relief. And basically, if we're stressed, we're meant to have more sex because it's a stress reduction. Is that something that you're even thinking about? Is that something that you're factoring in? Can you have sex? Are these thoughts and conversations that you have with your doctors? And what's your, where are you with this question? Yeah, we plan on addressing that soon. I do get a lot of questions about sex, orgasms, and semen retention. Okay, because there is a part of me that thinks that's such a big release, even if it's just not with somebody else, on the the area of masturbation. All of these conversations I think are now we're having so much more we've had so many people on the podcast talking on this area and that was one of the things that really stood out I was like where is his sex in this protocol yeah yeah (laughs) we've as as a team we we've looked at it in a cursory view we've not done a deep dive and that's why I'm hesitant to talk about it yet because I try to only speak about things which we've measured and we Mm. can speak about with you know, we have data, scientific evidence and we have data to, to back it up. I try to avoid getting to any area that is not backed by that same rigor. And this is one where we're not ready yet to speak about because we haven't done, I think, a robust enough search. Uh, a bit like, for example, things we have, I published our, our April blueprint notes today. Every, every month I publish our field notes and I posted in the FAQ one of the more common ones we get, which is, do we do cold therapy? And yes. do we have a cold therapy protocol? And I don't. And we, it's not part of the Blueprint Protocol, not because there aren't potential benefits. Surely there may be. It's just we haven't been able to find the evidence to support it's beneficial for my aging objectives. And so it's a very narrow. So if you understand Blueprint is a process and a very narrow objective on aging, then you understand the context. So this is not to say anything against cold therapy or to not practice cold therapy. It's just not in our protocol because it doesn't meet our, our focus objective. Okay. 
I mean, there's just, there's so many things now, isn't there, that people are going to come to you with. I love uh, the comment section, but it's it's because like, you know, well, well, I'll say something like statement A, and then someone's going to come back and be like, you know, but did, like, like, I eat broccoli, and someone will be like, but did you rub the broccoli on your bare naked skin for two minutes to fill its energy prior to digesting it so that you could internalize its, you know, essence? And like everyone has such a like unique understanding of reality, <laughs> you know. Like, and like, I don't know. No, I didn't. I didn't rub it on my naked body. We just kind of boiled it for the low FODMAP score. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also like, have you not seen my protocol? Have you not seen how intense I'm doing this? I haven't. I haven't rubbed my broccoli, but I am doing everything else to the extreme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, people's people's comments are the best. You've written some of them on your um on your protocol, which I really want some people to just go and read because they're brilliant. Um, but one thing I really fascinating, because I know that you, you love the technology side of it, is AI. Okay, so personally, I am quite fascinated with the advancements in AI at the moment. Um, and we've seen a lot over the last few months. How has that affected your opinion um, to develop entirely novel ideas aided by, aided by AI? Mm-hmm. And what are your concerns around human survival on that? I would build the stack in the following way. AI is here. Its progress is inevitable. If we want to ride this wave into the future, we are best served by pairing the progress, our personal progress, with the progress of science and technology. And that is specifically uh, what I've done with Blueprint, which is build an algorithm that manages my health and wellness and can improve me at the speed of science and technology. And then that we basically say we're open to divorcing ourselves from all human norm and custom as we walk into the zeroth principle future and that we're going to embark on the most incredible endeavor ever. And the the only objective we have ahead of us right now, like the sole thing we have to do as a species, is goal align. We need to figure out how to cooperate with AI, with each other, with the planet, with ourselves. That is the only game we're playing right now, is can we actually cooperate for sustained existence? And what Blueprint does is it says, instead of trying to tackle goal alignment between AI and 8 billion humans, which is hard, uh, you tackle the goal alignment within self. Before, blame, uh, before Blueprint, I was a fragmented war zone of, of violence being enacted on my body, of what my brain wanted to do for self-destructive behaviors, of what my organs wanted to do for their best interest. And for the first time, I've achieved goal alignment or harmony or cooperation within myself for the first time in my entire life. So when I say, when we, when we talk about the conversation of AI, we need to be what we want AI to become. And if we look at ourselves and we're honest with ourselves, I don't think that passes today on the criteria in how we... Tr- we in how we treat and how we uh, treat our own bodies, and how we treat the planet, and how we treat each other, I don't think is what we want uh, to give birth to AI with, and that's why I think when in the conversation of you know Bing's AI and that that article in the New York Times of how scary and awful it was, uh, I forget what what uh, the chat bot's name was, and that's just a mirror of humans. Like we just simply showed a mirror to ourselves. We're like, oh my god, that is scary as fuck, uh, but like, yeah, that's us. And so to me, the revolution at hand is zeroism. It's solving uh, harmony and goal alignment within self and then taking the next step with each other, then AI, and then the planet. And uh, it's, it's go time for the human species to say, are we part of the future or are we not? But it, it, we don't have time to mess around. Well, I don't think we do have time just from seeing the advancements of where it's going. You know, is there, is there a worry in your mind that AI could overtake us? Because there's parts of it now where I think in the next year we're going to be seeing a lot of people digitally, someone like you, okay, has not said what you've said, but it's been manifested in an AI 
to actually yeah. say things that's not come out of your voice. And I think this is where yeah. it becomes worrying, where people become versions of themselves, digital versions that are created yeah. by others. Yeah. And that's, I think, what the worry is. Does that worry you at all? If you, to, to baseline ourselves... Humanity's been through some pretty tough stuff. The Crusades, the plague, which was a few centuries long, World War I, World War II. And if you read through the history books, people were pretty down in those moments, not seeing the light of the future, how they'd ever come out of that darkness. And somehow they did, and somehow we exist right now. So it's not that the human race has not been through incredibly difficult things. It's not that they haven't felt saddened before. But uh, the fact that we exist is, shows evidence that if somebody lacked hope in that situation, they would have been wrong. That mm. the human race was able to overcome that challenge. They were able to move forward, not without loss. But I think we would fall to the same predictable biochemical reactions where we would say, oh boy, this seems challenging. We all feel sad and overwhelmed, but that's how every generation of humans ever felt with the challenges they have. And yes, the circumstances are different and unique. There's a species of intelligence that's, that's, more, that's superior to us in every way. And so to me, it really is how, to, how do we thoughtfully try to integrate ourselves into this uh, new future where we, we get to continue to exist? How do, we not destroy each, how do we not destroy ourselves? How do we stay alive? How do we not destroy each other? And how do we play nice with AI and the planet? How do we not destroy ourselves? How do we not destroy others? How do we not destroy the planet? And how do we play nice with all with AI and everyone so we can all exist and play games? And do you think some protocols need to come in for that? Do you think some kind of governance needs to come in around AI to stop that? Because otherwise I don't think it's going to stop. This larger conversation of what to do with AI is, is, is a gigantic conversation uh, to be had. The, the value I would offer is I would say... If we say, what is the root of the majority of our problems in existence, from our individual selves to each other to uh, our, you know, the planetary challenges we, we face with our biosphere, and even in AI, it's our inner demons. And Blueprint is an effort to eliminate those from me. It's to say, I have these propensities, these proclivities, I cannot trust myself, uh, I had to revert to an algorithm to manage me for me because I was incapable of doing it. And this is where I think, this is the, going back to Thomas Paine and his common sense essay, we as a species are ruled by a tyrannical monarch, our minds. And we're accustomed to pointing at everyone and everything except for ourselves. And I think the future will require us to walk through it through ourselves. It will require us to confront the pain of all the things we don't want to look at and uh, be the thing we want to become. So people that are listening to this and thinking, okay, I'm going to struggle to follow everything you're saying in your protocol, and I, but I'm really wanting mm. to kind of do a bit more of deep work on myself or, or take, those take that next step that I can. Yeah. What would you say are the things that have had the greatest impact for you that people can do? Number one is become aware of your sad behaviors, your self aided destruction. So anything you do which accelerates your speed of aging, become aware of. Now, if you stop them, if you can stop them, wonderful. But just become aware of them. And, and so the easy ones are eating too much food, eating junk food, skipping your bedtime, or missing your bedtime and skipping exercise. Those are the easy ones. Then alcohol and, and smoking. There's more nuanced things like you know gaming and other stuff like that. But like, let's, let's exclude the nuanced ones and just say the basic ones. Um, a lot of people try to cope with themselves by trying to do positive things. The first step is to realize how much negative you're doing to yourself. And sometimes the most positive thing you can do for yourself is stop the negative. And then number two is everyone has the power to get the basics right. Exercise, sleep, and just, like, just those basics. Like to they're in everyone's power to do those things. And that's a really great starting point of uh, how to start the journey. Thank you so much for, for coming on. And it's been a complete pleasure to have a conversation with you today. And Likewise. I can't wait to see, can't wait to see where you go. You were a wonderful host. Really enjoyed talking to with you. That conversation was incredible. Available exclusively to Apple subscribers, there is a new bonus episode out right now 
where you can hear from Brian about the one thing that's had the biggest impact on his health. Sign up for the free trial on Apple Podcasts. Don't miss out because you won't find this exclusive content anywhere else.